Dear family and dear friends, thank you for coming to celebrate a prolonged existence. I always thought that some people get unnecessarily old and that it would never happen to me. Surprise, surprise. Some of you may wonder who is this guy who spent most of his life doing all those things around the walls? I will try to answer very briefly and by using an unexpected method. I arrived at it by getting old. As we experience aging, we all realize that with time we have minor or more distressing physical difficulties. We also lose dear family members and cherished friends. And it is quite common that we can't remember names, numbers, even faces, or what happened the day before yesterday. But there are sometimes quite vivid recollections that arise from the distant, long forgotten past. I propose to give you a brief overview of my career based on some unexpected recollections. In my earliest memory, I was three years old and walking with holding both hands of my parents skipping and running and I asked who were those two strange men who were at, grandpa at our grandparents' party, dinner party. It turned out to be two men whom grandfather had brought home because he felt that they needed a decent meal. And grandmother was always ready, being used to his habit, and always had enough to give them. Love your neighbor, lesson learned. An unexpected memory also occurred to me the next year when I was four years old and for my birthday was given a small box of colored pencils. The crayons fascinated me and I used them right away decorating the walls of my nursery. And I also made a, a decision that painting or something close to it would be my life occupation. I was probably the youngest muralist of the time. From memories to facts, I went to school and later to the University of Charles University in Prague. Because my father had persuaded me that the legal profession would be a more uh, dependable future than art. How right he was. At the same time, I continued my education in art and must thank my parents for letting me 
spend all my free time in Paris, which was then the focus of the art world. I took history art of art lessons at the Sorbonne, and I worked in the studio of Otto and Fries, and later also took lessons in the studio of Paul Collin, who was a well-known painter at the time. His Ami was a very good-looking woman who posed as our model. And at lunchtime, we retired to an adjoining room where she presided over lunch and made sure that the, the conversation uh, stayed within appropriate boundaries. This was the time of the Munich meetings between the chief of the British government and Adolf Hitler in Munich. We all did trust him, but I had an uncle who lived in Amsterdam and he didn't believe him at all. He made several phone calls to us, urging us to get out of the Czech Republic because German invasion was imminent. Finally, he hired a DC-3 and we all piled into it and left for Amsterdam. The family took the plane to London and I took the train to Paris where I was met by my parents at the Gare du Nord. On the trip, I had time to consider how my life had changed. From a student of law with aspirations and a love for art, to a slightly upset refugee with a small suitcase. I noticed that my father was badly shaken by the turn of events. He had been the senior head of the family business and now had lost everything. I installed my parents in a hotel on the Rue Saint-Honoré called St. James, perhaps because the staff spoke English. I soon realized that a quieter surrounding would be more suitable to them, and I moved them to a very nice pension near Nice and arranged for a very good French teacher. So began an exile during which I continued my art studies with Victor Tischler and started a job with Richard Lindner, who was famous for his design and poster work and later became a big name when he moved to New York. After living in Paris for a year, I heard from London that my uncle Leon and his wife Thea had taken off on a trip to New York and explored the US and Canada for business opportunities. Thea got sick when they reached Vancouver 
and that gave Leon time to look around and he found a sawmill in New Westminster which had been down for some time because of the depression. He made an offer which was accepted and he now needed reliable assistance to run the mill. He contacted several men who had worked for the company before and also offered a job to my brother Fred and to me. Fred was an experienced businessman who had received his training in Genoa working for a related business outfit and also spoke perfect Italian which was a help. So we bid goodbye Europe, met in Cherbourg and sailed on the Empress of Australia to Quebec City. The train trip across Canada was a revelation. The size of the country and the diversity of the landscape was most impressive. We were taken on a sightseeing tour and admired the high mountains surrounding the inlet, the harbour area and the recently completed Lionsgate Bridge. It was always my hope that I would someday live near the ocean and here was one of the most beautiful sights I could imagine. Later, I had the opportunity to explore the Okanagan and was fascinated by its natural beauty. I also had very pleasant experiences when I met the inhabitants of my new home and made many dear respected friends. Of course, my most respected friend is my lady friend who writes uh, under the name Lisa Burney. It is hard to believe now the memories of Vancouver because they recall a small city which had only a minor building on Georgia Street where its art gallery showed some Emily cars and some group of seven paintings. There was only one commercial art gallery on Robson Street. It was run by a Mr. Wood, a very nice man, but it was really a framing shop. The day after our arrival, I started working on the booming ground, scaling logs. It was a new experience and I fell in a couple of times, but it was summer so the Fraser River was warm. In 1951, after several years, I finally was able to leave the company and started teaching, first at the Vancouver School of Art and later at the University of British Columbia. I had learned quite a bit from Victor Tischler. He taught me how to handle oil paints, brushes, knives and canvases. I also found that like the earlier memories I described, ideas and visual entities often take hold and call for realization on a canvas or board. The emergence and persistence 
are quite mysterious. But their assertion is quite clear and calls for action. This creative urge leads to distinctive formations driven by passionate impulse. Creativity can be manifest in an original thought, a sudden insight, or even an invisible hint or unseen discovery. It is often supported by driving passion. It always requires a true dedication, even a stubbornness, to proceed, regardless of fashionable trends, and also disregarding false starts. In fact, I found that false starts should be carefully measured, for they often lead to satisfactory solutions. The other requirement is to give the work undivided concentration and pack it completely with all your feelings, perceptions, and beliefs. If these requirements are met and further strengthened by passion, then a wonderful cooperation between the hand guiding the brush or whatever utensil and the canvas. You act with every stroke and the canvas responds. The evaluation of the work often proves that destroying forms which seemed unnecessary can lead to positive results, echoing nature's phases of destruction and new birth. <coughs> when everything seems to work, when the final solution is the result of the initial impulse, there may arise a feeling of elation, for the work has come to life. It does not last long. A new idea settles in the conscious mind and asks mercilessly to be dealt with. You may think that my description of the process makes it unnecessary to come out with what could be described as the shock of the new and prices at New York's auctions may confirm this assumption. But it is quite far from my objective. My guideline is a true expression independent of recent trends. In fact, I even hold the view that elements of landscape being a ground level reflection of the realm of the spirit are too essential to ourselves to be totally ignored. My aim is to provide the viewer of the work with everything I can provide a sense of celebration of the abounding wealth of nature and personal invention. Individual approach differed sometimes when these issues were discussed with my colleagues at the art school. But we got along very well, particularly when two Americans appeared and intended to establish 
an art school in Vancouver. We had a meeting at my house on Adira Street, and it was agreed that it would represent those presents. They were bird binning, Jack Shedboard, Gordon Smith, and yours truly. Group shows and solo exhibitions were very successful and were held. We were called the Vancouver Group of Modernist Painters, and our work was in sharp contrast to the work of the Group of Seven. We had no common program and worked in individual directions, but we were connected by amicable friendships. To this contributed the kind hospitality of Beth and Lauren Harris. They held regular musical evenings at their house on Belmont and played classical recordings, followed by lively discussions. One summer, the Harrises were out of town and their whole collection of records or stolen. That was the end of the music. But Lauren remained our respected and well-liked friend. I am sure that the extreme prices of his paintings today would make him laugh in disbelief. In 1977, after my dear daughters, Sydney and Diane, were married, I moved into an apartment with a balcony which gave a view of the distant sea and islands. I was instantly impressed and ready to go for it, but we were supposed to leave for Africa in a week's time. So the planned balcony series, which later developed into a large group of paintings, had to be put on ice for a whole year. Steve and Diane had gone to Nigeria to teach for CUSO, and we missed them after almost 12 months so we had accepted their invitation to visit them at Biu, a small village in northern Nigeria. We loved the country, the people in their colorful robes, the lively market scenes, the bicyclists racing by on the rundown road, balancing a rolled up heavy carpet on his head, no hands of course. At a Christmas service, there was a procession. Mary carrying a very pink looking plastic baby doll, followed by several shepherds and a number of mooing sheep. And then the Roman soldiers who fired pistols and made all the, freak, the frightened children present run down to the trail the aisles to the exit. There were also regular grass fires that came often quite close to the house. Enough material to produce my only figurative group of paintings. After my return to Vancouver, I was very pleased that the balcony theme had not faded away, but was still at full strength so that it produced over 
300 paintings. The Garden of Eden series started after one of several visits to Japan. My fondness of the Japanese aesthetic goes back to my teens when I saw some of the Yukioe woodcuts in the Louvre. I loved their principle of restraint, which was evident in their houses, their traditional costumes, which they still wore for special occasions, and their inventiveness in food, and particularly their temple gardens. This contained no flowers, shrubs, or trees, but consisted simply of beautifully raked sand and well-chosen and placed stones. Their function is to lead to quiet observation, then to interior contemplation and to meditation. It is true that during the last war, some military men showed despicable cruelty. But it is also evident that the Japanese aesthetic and general attitude to life developed a patient serenity which made them cope with grief and natural disasters in an admirably composed way. Turning to my well-loved surrounding, I produced a large series I called Pacific Gateways. I should say that it has never been my intent to depict nature in mirror-like images, but rather by allusion and inventive innuendo. At the same time, references to natural forms are important to me because I believe that physical appearances are really reflections of the spiritual reality. I see the gateways as metaphors of a transition between the here and now and a higher existence. I also observed similarities between our glorious coast and its counterpart in Japan. I think of the gateways as Pacific, that is peaceful, peaceful way that we all must someday go through to another reality. The music of the Sphere series is based on some observed phenomenon in outer space, which confirms the huge range of nature's creativity. The cosmic paintings also eulogize the vast inventiveness of nature in the far reaches of the cosmos and required a more abstract form. This retrospective gives me a rare opportunity to talk about myself. And I also want to state clearly what my intended direction is. It tries to state a view that may contribute a little bit to make the world a happier place to live in. I arrived at this aim early in life by observing in my dear father 
a trade of pessimism and I wanted to change that. As to influences, I always loved the warm colors in the paintings of Giorgione and the joie de vivre that illuminates the work of Matisse. <clears throat> Finally, I was struck by the work of the Cubis who reflected quite unknowingly, I'm sure, Einstein's special theory of relativity by seeing objects from several sides at once and also at high speed. My work's direction was influenced by the teaching of Boyin Ra. After the world was given the glad tidings 2,000 years ago, he is the most authoritative voice who confirms it and further illuminates it. I believe to be very fortunate to have discovered his writings and it has influenced my life and my work. I know of no other artist who knows of the truth he expresses expresses in his works. For me, they were and are the most important lesson I ever learned. Here is a lovely translation that I made from one of his writings. Take your life the way it is. Don't think it should be changed. Don't damn any of your days. Whatever in your, is your burden, bear it. Whatever comes your way, bless it, and you shall be blessed.